in moral character calhoun was as reproachless as washington he neither drank to excess nor gambled nor violated the seventh commandment he had no fellowship with either fools or knaves he believed that the office of senator was the highest to which americans could ordinarily attain and he gave dignity to it and felt its responsibilities he thought that only the best and most capable men should be elevated to that post nor would he seek it by unworthy ends the office sought him not he the office it was this pure and exalted character which gave him such an ascendancy at the south as much as his marvellous logical powers and his devotion to southern interests his constituents believed in him and followed him perhaps blindly therefore when we consider what are generally acknowledged as his mistakes we should bear in mind the palliating circumstances calhoun was the incarnation of southern public opinion bigoted narrow prejudiced but intense in its delusions and loyal to its dogmas hence he enslaved others as he was himself enslaved he was alike the idol and the leader of his state impossible to be dethroned as webster was with the people of massachusetts until he misrepresented their convictions the consistency of his career was marvellous not that he did not change some of his opinions for there is no intellectual progress to a man who does not how can a young man however gifted be infallible but whatever the changes through which his mind passed they did not result from self-interest or ambition but were the result of more enlightened views and enlarged experience political wisdom is not a natural instinct but a progressive growth like that of burke the profoundest of all the intellects of his generation calhoun made several great speeches in the senate of the united states besides those in reference to a banking system connected with the government which whether wise or erroneous contained some important truths but the logical deduction of them all may be summed up in one idea the supremacy of state rights in opposition to a central government this from the time when the diverging interests of the north and the south made him feel the dangers in the unchecked will of a majority of the whole was the dogma of his life from which he never swerved and which he pursued to all its legitimate conclusions whatever measure tended to the consolidation of central power whether in reference to the encroachments of the executive or the usurpations of congress he denounced with terrible earnestness and sometimes with great eloquence this is the key to the significant portion of his political career in his speech on the force bill in eighteen thirty four he says if we now raise our eyes and direct them towards that once beautiful system with all its various separate and independent parts blended into one harmonious whole we must be struck with the mighty change all have disappeared gone absorbed concentrated and consolidated in this government which is left alone in the midst of the desolation of the system the sole and unrestricted representative of an absolute and despotic majority in the place of their admirably contrived system the act proposed to be repealed has erected our great consolidated government can it be necessary for me to show what must be the inevitable consequences it was clearly foreseen and foretold on the formation of the constitution what these consequences would be all the calamities we have experienced and those which are yet to come are the result of the consolidating tendency of this government and unless this tendency be arrested all that has been foretold will certainly befall us even to the pouring out of the last vial of wrath military despotism that was what mr calhoun feared that the consolidation of a central power would be fatal to the liberties of the country and the rights of the states and would introduce a system of spoils and the reign of demagogues all in subserviency to a mere military chieftain utterly unfit to guide the nation in its complicated interests but his gloomy predictions fortunately were not fulfilled in spite of all the misrule and obstinacy of the man he intensely distrusted and disliked the tendency has been to usurpations by congress rather than by the executive it is impossible not to admire the lofty tone free from personal animus which is seen in all calhoun's speeches they may have been sophistical but they appealed purely to the intellect of those whom he addressed without the rhetoric of his great antagonists his speeches are compact arguments such as one would address to the supreme court on his side of the question thus far his speeches in the senate had been in reference to economic theories and legislation antagonistic to the interests of the south 
and the usurpations of executive power which threatened directly the rights of independent states and indirectly the liberties of the people and the political degradation of the nation but now new issues arose from the agitation of the slavery question and his fame chiefly rests on his persistent efforts to suppress this agitation as logically leading to the dissolution of the union and the destruction of the institution with which its prosperity was supposed to be identified the early abolitionists as i remember them were as a body of very little social or political influence they were earnest clear-headed and uncompromising in denouncing slavery as a great moral evil indeed as a sin disgraceful to a free people and hostile alike to morality and civilization but in the general apathy as to an institution with which the constitution did not meddle and the general government could not interfere except in districts and territories under its exclusive control the abolitionists were generally regarded as fanatical and mischievous they had but few friends and supporters among the upper classes and none among politicians the pulpit the bar the press and the colleges were highly conservative and did not like the popular agitation much better than the southerners themselves but the leaders of the anti-slavery movement persevered in their denunciations of slaveholders and of all who sympathized with them they held public meetings everywhere and gradually became fierce and irritating it was the period of lyceum lectures when all moral subjects were discussed before the people with fearlessness and often with acrimony most of the popular lecturers were men of radical sympathies and were inclined to view all evils on abstract principles as well as in their practical effects thus the advocates of peace believed that war under all circumstances was wicked the temperance reformers insisted that the use of alcoholic liquors in all cases was a sin learned professors in theological schools attempted to prove that the wines of palestine were unfermented and could not intoxicate the radical abolitionists in like manner asserted that it was wicked to hold a man in bondage under any form of government or under any guarantee of the constitution at first they were contented to point out the moral evils of slavery both on the master and the slave but this did not provoke much opposition since the evils were open and confessed even at the south only it was regarded as none of their business since the evils could not be remedied and had always been lamented that slavery was simply an evil and generally acknowledged to be both north and south was taking rather tame ground even as peace doctrines were unexciting when it was allowed that if we must fight we must but there was some excitement in the questions whether it were allowable to fight at all or drink wine at any time or hold a slave under any circumstances the lecturers must take stronger grounds if they wish to be heard or to excite interest so they next unhesitatingly assumed the ground that war was a malum per se and wine drinking also and all slaveholding and a host of other things their discussions aroused the intellect as well as appealed to the moral sense even strong-minded women fearlessly went into fierce discussions and became intolerant gradually the whole north and west were aroused not merely to the moral evils of slavery which were admitted without discussion but to the intolerable abomination of holding a slave under any conditions as against reason against conscience and against humanity the southerners themselves felt that the evil was a great one and made some attempt to remedy it by colonization societies they would send free blacks to liberia to christianize and civilize the natives sunk in the lowest abyss of misery and shame many were the christian men and women at the south who pitied the hard condition under which their slaves were born and desired to do all they could to ameliorate it but when the abolitionists announced that all slaveholding was a sin and when public opinion at the north was evidently drifting to this doctrine then the planters grew indignant and enraged it became unpleasant for a northern merchant or traveler to visit a southern city and equally unpleasant for a southern student to enter a northern college or a planter to resort to a northern watering place the common sense of the planter was outraged when told that he was a sinner above all others he was exasperated beyond measure when incendiary publications were transmitted through southern mails he did not believe that he was necessarily immoral because he retained an institution bequeathed to him by his ancestors and recognized by the constitution of the united states calhoun was the impersonation of southern feelings as well as the representative of southern interests he intensely felt the indignity which the abolitionists cast upon his native state and upon its peculiar institution 
and he was clear-headed enough to see that if public opinion settled down into the conviction that slavery was a sin as well as an inherited evil the north and south could not live long together in harmony and peace he saw that any institution would be endangered with the verdict of the civilized world against it he knew that public opinion was an amazing power which might be defied but not successfully resisted he saw no way to stop the continually increasing attacks of the anti-slavery agitators except by adopting an entirely new position a position which should unite all the slaveholding states in the strongest ties of interest accordingly he declared as the leader of southern opinions and interests that slavery was neither an evil nor a sin but a positive good and blessing supported even by the bible as well as by the constitution in assuming these premises he may have argued logically but he lost the admiration he had gained by twenty years services in the national legislature his premises were wrong and his arguments would necessarily be sophistical and fall to the ground he stepped down from the lofty pedestal he had hitherto occupied to become not merely a partisan but an unscrupulous politician he had a right to defend his beloved institutions as the leader of interests entrusted to him to guard his fault was not in being a partisan for most politicians are party men it was in advancing a falsehood as the basis of his arguments but if he had stultified his own magnificent intellect he could not impose on the convictions of mankind from the time he assumed a ground utterly untenable whatever were his motives or real convictions his general influence waned his arguments did not convince since they were deductions from wrong premises and premises which shocked and insulted the reason calhoun now became a man of one idea and that a false one he was a gigantic crank an arch jesuit indifferent to means so long as he could bring about his end and he became not merely a casuist but a dictatorial and arrogant politician he defied that patriotic burst of public opinion which had compelled him to change his ground that mighty wave of thought no more to be resisted than a storm upon the ocean and which he saw would gradually sweep away his cherished institution unless his constituents in the whole south should be made to feel that their cause was right and just that slavery had not only materially enriched the southern states but had converted fetich idolaters to the true worship of god and widened the domain of civilization the planters one and all responded to the sophistical and seductive plea and said to one another now we can defy the universe on moral grounds we stand united what care we for the ravings of fanatics outside our borders so long as our institution is a blessing to us planted on the rock of christianity and endorsed by the best men among us the theologians took up the cause both north and south and made their pulpits ring with appeals to scripture were not they said the negroes descendants of ham and had not these descendants been cursed by the almighty and given over to the control of the children of shem and japheth not indeed to be trodden down like beasts but to be elevated and softened by them and made useful in the toils which white men could not endure ultra calvinists united with politicians in building up a public sentiment in favor of slavery as the best possible condition for the ignorant sensuous and superstitious races who when put under the training and guardianship of a civilized and christian people had escaped the harder lot which their fathers endured in the deserts and the swamps of africa the agitation at the north had been gradually but constantly increasing in eighteen thirty one william lloyd garrison started the liberator in eighteen thirty two the new england anti-slavery society was founded in boston in eighteen thirty three new york had a corresponding society and joshua levitt established the emancipator books tracts and other publications began to be circulated by lectures newspapers meetings and all manner of means of propagandism was carried on on the other hand the most violent opposition had been manifested throughout the north to these so-called fanatics no language was too opprobrious to apply to them the churches and ministry were either dumb on the subject or defended slavery from the scriptures mobs broke up anti-slavery meetings and in some cases proceeded even to the extreme of attack and murder as in the case of lovejoy of illinois the approach of the political campaign of eighteen thirty six when van buren was running as the successor of jackson involved the democratic party as the ally of the south for political purposes and harmony and union were the offsets to the cry for emancipation 
by eighteen thirty five the excitement was at its height and especially along the line of the moral and religious argumentation where the pro-slavery men met talk with talk what could the abolitionists do now with their northern societies to show that slavery was a wrong and a sin their weapons fell harmless on the bucklers of warriors who supposed themselves fighting under the protection of almighty power in order to elevate and christianize a doomed race victory seemed to be snatched from victors and in the moral contest the southern planters and their northern supporters swelled the air with triumphant shouts they were impregnable in their new defenses since they claimed to be in the right both parties had now alike appealed to reason and scripture and where were the judges who could settle conflicting opinions the abolitionists somewhat discouraged but undaunted then changed their mode of attack they said we will waive the moral question for we talk to men without conscience and we will instead make it a political one we will appeal to majorities we will attack the hostile forces in a citadel which they cannot hold the district of columbia belongs to congress congress can abolish slavery if it chooses in its own territory having possession of this great fortress we can extend our political warfare to the vast and indefinite west and at least prevent the further extension of slave power we will trust to time and circumstance and truth to do the rest we will petition congress itself and from eighteen thirty five onward petitions rolled into both houses from all parts of the north and west to abolish slavery in the district of columbia which congress could constitutionally do the venerable and enlightened john quincy adams headed the group of petitioners in the house of representatives there were now two thousand anti-slavery societies in the united states in eighteen thirty seven three hundred thousand persons petitioned for the abolition of slavery in the district of columbia the legislatures of massachusetts and vermont had gone so far as to censure congress for its inaction and indifference to the rights of humanity but it was in january eighteen thirty six that john c calhoun arose in his wrath and denied the right of petition the indignant north responded to such an assumption in flaming words what said the leaders of public opinion cannot the lowest subjects of the czar or the shah appeal to ultimate authority has there ever been an empire so despotic as to deny so obvious a right did not caesar and cyrus louis and napoleon receive petitions shall an enlightened congress reject the prayers of the most powerful of their constituents and to remove an evil which people generally regard as an outrage and all people as a misfortune we will not allow the reception of petitions at all said the southern leaders for they will lead to discussion on a forbidden subject they are only an entrance wedge to disrupt the union the constitution has guaranteed to us exclusively the preservation of an institution on which our welfare rests you usurp a privilege which you call a right your demands are dangerous to the peace of the union and are preposterous you violate unwritten law you seek to do what the founders of our republic never dreamed of when two of the states ceded their own slave territory to the central government it was with the understanding that slavery should remain as it was in the district we owned and controlled you cannot lawfully even discuss the matter it is none of your concern it is an institution which was the basis of that great compromise without which there never could have been a united nation only a league of sovereign states we have the same right to exclude the discussion of this question from these halls as from the capitals of our respective states the right of petition on such a subject is tantamount to consideration and discussion which would be unlawful interference with our greatest institution leading legitimately and logically to disunion and war is it right is it generous is it patriotic to drive us to such an alternative we only ask to be let alone you assail a sacred ark where dwell the seraphim and cherubim of our liberties of our honor of our interests of our loyalty itself to this we never will consent mr clay then came forward in congress as an advocate for considering the question of petitions he was for free argument on the subject he admitted that the abolitionists were dangerous but he could not shut his eyes to an indisputable right so he went halfway as was his custom pleasing neither party and alienating friends but at the same time with great tact laying out a middle ground where the opposing parties could still stand together without open conflict i am no friend said he to slavery the searcher of hearts knows that every pulsation of mind beats high and strong in the cause of civil liberty 
wherever it is practicable and safe i desire to see every portion of the human family in the enjoyment of it but i prefer the liberty of my own country to that of other people the liberty of the descendants of africa in the united states is incompatible with the liberty and safety of the european descendants such were the sentiments of the leading classes of the north not yet educated up to the doctrines which afterwards prevailed but the sentiments declared by clay lost him the presidency his political sins like those of webster were sins of omission rather than of commission neither of them saw that the little cloud in the horizon would soon cover the heavens and pour down a deluge to sweep away abominations worse than ahab ever dreamed of clay did not go far enough to please the rising party he did not see the power or sustain the rightful exercise of this new moral force but he did argue on grounds of political expediency for the citizens right of petition a right conceded even to the subjects of unlimited despotism an asser harris could throw petitions into the mire without reading but it was customary to accept them the result was a decision on the part of congress to admit the petitions but to pay no further attention to them the abolitionists however had resorted to less scrupulous measures they sent incendiary matter through the mails not with the object of inciting the slaves to rebellion this was hopeless but with the design of aiding their escape from bondage and perchance of influencing traders in the southern camp to this new attack calhoun responded with dignity and with logic and we cannot reasonably blame him for repelling it the southern cities had as good a right to exclude inflammatory pamphlets as new york or boston has to prevent the introduction of the cholera it was the instinct of self-preservation whatever may be said of their favorite institution on ethical grounds they had the legal right to protect it from incendiary matter but what was incendiary matter who should determine that point president jackson in eighteen thirty five had recommended congress to pass a law prohibiting under severe penalties the circulation in the southern states through the mails of incendiary publications but this did not satisfy the southern dictator he denied the right of congress to determine what publications should be or should not be excluded he maintained that this was a matter for the states alone to decide he would not trust postmasters for they were officers of the united states government it was not for them to be inquisitors nor for the federal government to interfere even for the protection of a state institution with its own judgment he proposed instead a law forbidding federal postmasters to deliver publications prohibited by the laws of a state territory or district in this as in all other controverted questions calhoun found means to argue for the supremacy of the state and the subordination of the union his bill did not pass but the force of his argument went forth into the land End of section 13.